All right. <sighs> okay, how's everybody doing out there this evening, Eric? Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. We are going to get going in just a second. I'm going to throw a few polls out here first, though. And I hope everyone's doing all right. It's about 8 o'clock here on the West Coast. Um, we're watching from another time zone. Um, I understand it might be quite late, so I want to thank you for tuning in. And we are going to talk about China. I'm just going to quick throw up a poll, and then we'll... Two polls actually, and we'll get right on to it. Ooh, raining. Not fun. <laughs> it's hotter than the blazes out here. Well, it's you know, it gets cold during the day, then it heats up at night. So I'm going to throw up a quick, uh, what we call in the education sphere, a formative assessment, a little poll, just see what we know already about China going into this thing. And uh, go ahead and answer that, and then uh, we will go ahead and get started in just a minute. Let some you know, stragglers come on in. But yeah, we're going to have a, we're have a nice time. All right, so first little poll up there is just a little formative assessment. If you want to <clears throat> go ahead and let me know what you know already, if you know a lot, you know a little, uh, if you have some kind of connection to China, um, not an uncommon thing. Um, to, to I have many students who have a connection to China uh, culturally, uh, their parents or they themselves were born in China, so it's, it's not unusual. But yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll wait we'll wait one more minute. We'll let some people, anybody straggle in, and we'll get started at 8 o'clock sharp, according to my, according to my clock. Um, a few things to note, and I'll, uh, I'll probably say this again over the course of the cast, um, but Chinese history is long, and it does get a little complicated. And so if at any time while I'm talking, uh, you, you have a question, or I said something, and it doesn't jive with something you heard, or you're just really curious about this thing, and feel free to just throw a question in the comments, even if it's not directly related to what we're talking about. You know, that's what we're here for. This is supposed to be more interactive than just me telling you stuff. So if you have a question or you want to make a connection, like something sounds similar to something else you've heard, by all means, please bring it in. We welcome that. We want to we want to get some dialogue going, if possible. So by all means, don't be afraid. You know, I don't bite. Not that I could through a computer screen, but, you know, questions are the best way to Best way to get these things going. So just putting that out there. And with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, my name is Evan Little. I am an AP World History teacher out in California, and I've been teaching this class for about four and a half years now, and I just I just love it. And one of the reasons I love it so much is just because you, I get to learn so much while I'm teaching people so much. A lot of the stuff that I've put into this presentation I'm going to tell you about tonight, uh, I had to learn myself while preparing to teach this course. And so I think that's one of the great rewards of AP World is not only are you learning, but your teacher might be learning too. So it's a, it's a good thing. That said, let's go ahead and get started. And just before we dive in, a reminder always, uh, think Fiveable, follow us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, just give us a follow. Always think Fiveable, you are five able. So just a little shout out there. And of course, we have some wonderful, wonderful streams coming up this week and this weekend. We've got Melissa um, with a nice introduction to an SAQ, and we're going to look at an example SAQ. So maybe some of the stuff you can uh, you can take with you if you go check out that stream. Uh, we have Caroline talking about South Asia. That's going to be exciting. We have Jed 
taking on the Mediterranean and Southwest Asia. Also going to be great. Can't wait to see that. I'm going to try to get that one myself. Um, we have um, Sophia and Skylar. We're going to be talking about studying AP World from a student perspective. So again, if you're a student and you want to get some study tips, that would be a great place. That would be a great stream to check out. Uh, Jillian is going to be taking care of Europe and the global Middle Ages and also sounds like a really exciting one. Uh, that's going to be coming up uh, later this week. And then Jamal and, and Jed are both going to do a live study group. So that would be a really good uh, uh, study group to attend if you want to get a little, um, if you want to get a little uh, interactive questions from, again, a student perspective. Um, so that would always, that would be a great thing to, to check out if you got the time. All right. Um, so today, you know, the title of this is Continuities. And the reason why it says Continuities is we're actually going to talk about one of the historical reasoning skills, um, which is called Continuity and Change. And uh, go ahead and, and just raise your hand in comments if your teacher has already uh, maybe talked a little bit about Continuity and Change in class or said uh, the abbreviation, which is CCOT, uh, much easier to write than Continuity and Change. So if you haven't heard of CCOT, I'll probably say it a couple times, if not most of the time uh, this evening, just because it's way easier to say uh, than change and continuity or continuity and change over time. It's just, oh boy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to talk about some ways to approach it. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about medieval China, and then we're going to take some of those, we're going to take the, the skill of continuity and change, and we're going to apply it to medieval China. We're going to take some, some information we've learned and apply that to medieval China. So that's kind of a breakdown of what we're doing this evening. And let's go ahead and dive right in. So um, as I said before, has anybody's teacher mentioned continuity and change or maybe a classmate or you saw it in like a study book? You might have seen CCOT as its abbreviation. Has anybody seen that already? Teachers mentioning it or... I see we've, uh, John says we've been discussing the Tang and the Song Dynasty. That's, well, that's great because we're going to talk about them tonight too. Don't worry. We got you covered. Well, either I'll, maybe we'll, we'll get some new stuff or we'll reinforce some old stuff either way. And if John, if you got anything to add, by all means, if you think I'm leaving something out, please feel free to, to jump on in and let me know. So, well, if you haven't heard of CCOT, uh, then I guess this is going to be a nice introduction. So of the three historical reasoning processes, um, the CCOT is the third one, and essentially CCOT is describing a pattern, describing and explaining a pattern of continuity or change uh, over time. In rare cases, you might see a question that's for both a continuity and a change, um, but most questions only ask for one. That said, it's, it's not unheard of to see a question that asks for both. Um, so this may be on three out of the four parts of the AP exam. And when I say maybe, I mean it will be, but the degree to which it is um, will vary. So, for example, there are CCOT multiple choice questions, uh, but how many you might see it just depends on just depends on the test designers. You'll probably see at least one or two, um, but you, will you see you know ten? It's hard to say. Probably not, but uh, you'll also see, you might see them on a short answer question. This is a real maybe because sometimes we have a year with several multiple, uh, several SAQs uh, that include questions about continuity and change, and some years we have absolutely no questions about continuity and change. So it's kind of a it's kind of a, a gamble, but it it nonetheless never hurts to be prepared uh, for what you might encounter. So. You will also encounter them on the long essay question, uh, the LAQ. And you'll encounter continuity and change there because when writing the LAQ, you get a choice of which historical reasoning process you'd like to use writing that. And I don't want to say spend too much time on that here because we are going to have a stream in the future about uh, writing LAQs. I think we might have already had one. But when you're writing an LAQ, you get to choose a historical reasoning process. And one of those could be continuity and change. So there's three parts to continuity and change. And the first two parts are, are somewhat self-explanatory. So the described part merely means to identify or, you know, the what, um, the proper noun, 
the the fact, the piece of evidence, right? It's the it's describing it. It's the what. So um, the explaining part is is the why. And this generally goes for anything that says explain um, or analyze. They're usually asking for the why. So there's the what, and then there's the why. So what happened? Why did it happen? You get the idea. But then there's this third one down here, and it says explain the historic, relative historical significance of specific historical developments in relation, this part in bold, in relation to a larger pattern of continuity or change. And so what this is, is an old term we used to have in AP World, and it's no longer uh, officially in the, in, the, in the course outline anymore, but it's still a, a good skill to have. It's called periodization. And uh, this is a skill where you decide when a moment, an event, or a development in world history is so important. It is historically era shifting important that everything that came after that event uh, nothing was ever the same as it was before and i'm sure you could think of a few off the top of your head even this early in the course era shifting developments um i'll give you one example and, and maybe this is some food for thought uh back when the course included the classical era empires a lot of teachers would have periodization questions about something along the lines of did the fall of the roman empire uh, represent a turning point in world history um, or did the fall of the Han dynasty represent a turning point? They use this word turning point. And so what this third part of CCOT does is it's simply taking the same idea about time and picking a specific development um, in relationship to larger patterns. And so that's kind of what, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, something called zoom in, zoom out. We're going to dig into this a little bit more as we go on. Um, Eric just told me that the, the LEQ live review was actually going to be in a few weeks. So uh, hopefully maybe we'll have gotten all the historical reasoning processes out by then. And, and I would highly recommend you check out that review. So don't miss it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how to think about it. So that's, that's the nuts. That's the technical stuff. But let's talk about a way to really think about an essay. Um, Think about continuity and change just in your everyday, everyday life, not so technical. So a good way to think about continuity and change might be like a timeline, events on a timeline. This is what I usually tell my students. Think of studying events on a timeline. You've got a flat line with a bunch of events on it, right? And this helps you visualize the stream of time. Now, there's many ways to interpret how time is shaped, but it's easy to understand it as a straight line. And there's a list of events on said line. And I'll show you an example of this later. This is a good way to kind of get you into it. You see this line, and then you can pick events that indicate something staying the same over a long period of time, or events that are a change from a previous event over a long period of time. In other words, think of it like comparison. Now, you compare things all the time, right? Apples, oranges, basketball, football, um, uh, guitars, pianos. You put things side by side all the time. Um, and that's a comparison across space, right? That guitar and that piano, they're probably in the same place. This apple and orange, they're in the same place. So that would be a comparison across space. But change in continuity over time is a comparison across time. And that's a good way to think about it. It's not actually that complicated in the sense that you're just comparing two things. The difference is you're comparing them over time, not over space. For those of you who are really good at math, let me kind of put it in, in, in what we might call mathematical terms, if this makes it a little easier to understand. So you have the beginning of the time that you're studying, and that's A, and you have the ending of the time you're studying, and that's B. And the same, you're looking at the same development between A and B. And so if A is still equal to B by the end of the time frame, this would be considered a continuity. But if A does not equal B by the end of the time period, then that would be a change. So it's still a comparison. The difference is it's a time comparison, not a space comparison. We're not comparing, say, 
the Islamic realm and Europe, we're comparing the Islamic realm now versus the Islamic realm in 400 years. And so that's an easy way to think about it. It's just a comparison across time, not across space. And so if you're having a little trouble wrapping your head around it, it might not be a bad way to go. So, and of course, um, as always, you have to include, um, it's not just the what, but it's also the why. So if A equals B, then it's a continuity and Y. And if A does not equal B, then it's a change and Y. So I yeah, hope that might make it a little easier uh, for you to understand. If, if maybe you've heard about it and you're having a hard time getting your head around it, just think about it like a, a math problem, perhaps, or a logic problem. All right. Um, are there any questions before we go ahead and move on? Anything I've said that's confusing or getting to you or something you'd like some clarification about? Okay. All righty. Well, then let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, China. So really quick, just the official from the, from the college board on high. Um, officially, these are the three themes of AP World in which China is addressed during the first unit. In other words, during unit one, uh, College Board would like you to take note of these three themes, especially as it relates to China. So the first theme would be uh, government or politics, and the second theme would be culture, and the third theme would be uh, economics. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of fodder here we can look at for continuity and change over time. So for example, one of the things that the AP people would like you to be familiar with includes the Song Dynasty of China, which utilized traditional methods of Confucianism and an imperial bureaucracy to maintain and justify its rule. Now this phrase, traditional methods, implies a sort of continuity, right? From the old to the new, uh, to justify and maintain its rule. Um, when it comes to cultural features of China at this time in world history, uh, they'd like you to know that Buddhism continued to shape societies in Asia included and included a variety of branches, schools and practices. So within China, but also largely within East Asia, they want you to know that uh, Buddhism continued to shape and influence societies. So there's a continuity. There's an another example, and this time it's a little more obvious, the word continue. Uh, when it comes to economics, there's actually quite a bit of change. There's actually not that much in the way of continuity. Because the Song Dynasty, as some of you maybe have heard, it was a very dynamic a uh, very uh, explosive growth, a lot of changes going on. Um, but there is some continuity and they want you to be familiar with the fact that um, there's still, th this economy, while it is increasingly commercialized, depends on free peasant labor. In other words, it still depends on small peasants farming their land uh, and contributing the excess uh, surplus to the state. So that didn't change, even though we do see a lot of other changes in the Song Dynasty's economy uh, during this time. So that's just the official stuff. And this is some examples of how you could apply continuity uh, to a question that you might see about China. So here's also some vocabulary. And at this time, I'd like to invite you, if you have maybe a piece of paper nearby, uh, feel free to go ahead and take that out if you'd like to take notes. I'm gonna. I have some charts uh, I'll be showing you later that'll just kind of jam full of information. So if you'd like to jot some things down, by all means, I'd love to invite you to, to bust out a piece of paper if you got it or some other way to take notes um, at this time. So a few terms that you might encounter as they apply to China during this time that I'd just like to familiarize you with. Um, the first one would be a Mandarin. Now, some of you might be thinking, or man, sorry, Mandarin, um, and some of you might be thinking, wait a second, isn't that the, the, the primary dialect of Chinese? Haven't I been told that, um, isn't that the, well, it's Mandarin, um, not a Mandarin. 
Uh, a Mandarin is an imperial bureaucrat who these existed for most of Chinese history, beginning with uh, the Sui Dynasty onward into the to the Qing Dynasty in the 20th century. Um, and these were bureaucrats who were chosen by the civil service exam, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the civil service exam was sort of like the test you had to take to get into the government, to work for the government in China. I had a chance this summer to actually visit China, and I got to see a civil service exam uh, testing room. And it's a little teeny tiny room, and you have a bench, and you have a platform, and you pretty much get shut up in there for a week, um, and you have to bring your own food, and you have to bring your own mattress to sleep on, uh, and if for some reason you die uh, while taking that test, if people did die, uh, they just took your body out of your cubby and they threw it over the wall um, to make room for another applicant. So it was, I mean, if you think the AP test and you think high school was brutal, uh, just imagine that. Um, anyhow, uh, another word, and we're going to reference this one quite a bit, is something called the Grand Canal. Now, this is not actually a single canal. It's a, a series of canals. But what they did was they connected... Uh, the Chinese political cat center in the north with the Chinese agricultural center in the south near the Yangtze River. And so this is widely viewed as one of the things that connects the northern and southern parts of what today we call China. And this is the most notable accomplishment of the Sui dynasty right, in the early 600s. If um, uh, John and uh, I believe Shreya, you both mentioned, you talked about the Tang dynasty, the Sui dynasty came before the Tang Dynasty, and their most notable accomplishment was the creation of this Grand Canal. Another term you might need to be familiar with is nomads, and these are various groups of non-agricultural, non-settled people, and they battled against various Chinese dynasties, and they took different names, and sometimes they spoke different languages, but in general, um, the big ones you might need to know are the Mongols, who, you know, of course, when we get there, they've got, they, they'll have a stream all their own, don't worry. Um, the Jurchen, who fought against the Song Dynasty and eventually uh, took over parts of northern China, and the Huns, who clashed with the Han Dynasty, but became more famous when they moved over to Europe and terrorized the Roman Empire. Uh, but nonetheless, these are uh, nomadic groups that have battled and sometimes traded with peacefully. Um, the various Chinese dynasties throughout the centuries, including the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty and pretty much every dynasty. Sometimes they've even created dynasties, as was the case with the Mongols and the Qing, but uh, we'll talk more about that at some other time. The very last word I'd like to familiarize you with uh, is actually two words. One is called the Mandate of Heaven and the other is called the Dynastic Cycle. And so the Mandate of Heaven is the justification for imperial rule. And what it essentially is, is, a, is, a, is a, a story about how heaven, and what that exactly means is not entirely clear, although it usually means like a divine realm of sorts, um, smiles upon a ruler as long as they are good and they fulfill um, certain moral obligations. As long as they do that, heaven will smile upon them. Um, but once they start doing bad and evil and wicked things, heaven will not smile upon them, and in fact will make it possible for them to lose the mandate of heaven and be overthrown um, by various forces. The very first reference we have to the mandate of heaven is from one of the earliest dynasties, the Zhao dynasty, who claimed that the previous dynasty, the Shang dynasty, their emperor, had been an evil, wicked man who murdered children and ate their corpses. He was a terrible person, and therefore, he lost the mandate of heaven and was overthrown by a rebellion. Um, you might just pick up on how this ideology could be used to justify um, a new dynasty, um, est establish their legitimacy, and if you picked up on that, congratulations, because there's there was there was quite a bit of that. Um, but the dynastic cycle is a term for the idea that in Chinese history, and this is more of a historian's term, like emperors themselves didn't really think about this that much. Um, but the idea that the Chinese dynasties go through a cycle of rising, consolidation, and then weakening, and then collapsing. And so this explained why dynasties would rise and fall and 
and then new dynasties would rise and then fall. And so this is a term that kind of covers a general uh, swath of Chinese political history. So those are just some terms you should be familiar with. You may see them on the AP exam, or you may see them on your own exams. So it's a good idea to be familiar with some of these words, just in case you encounter them. Um, and here is a timeline of some of the places, uh, the dynasties we're going to be talking about today. Um, and these are rough approximations of their dates. Um, these are not their exact dates, but these are rough approximations. On the AP test, I get students ask me all the time to say, you know, Mr. Little, do we have to know every single date? And I tell them, you don't have to know every single date, but you should know in general when things occurred and when certain events were. So for example, you wouldn't have to know that the Tang Dynasty uh, rose in 618, or sorry, 621, see I just, see, I just messed it up right there, 621. Um, but you should know that the Tang Dynasty came after the Sui Dynasty and was in at least the 650s, right? So you should have a good, we call chronological reasoning. So maybe that puts your mind at ease a little bit. Um, anyway, so this is a rough outline of the dynasties we're gonna be talking about today. Um, the Sui Dynasty, as I mentioned before, the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, and it sounds like some people in chat have said they've already talked a little bit about that. The Yuan Dynasty, AKA the Mongol Dynasty, uh, and the Ming Dynasty, which succeeded that, and of course goes outside of the scope of this unit, but they'll get a little mention just because they're, they're near the end. So we will keep going. So, um, any questions so far before I move on to another, before I move on to another, a little more information about medieval China? Any questions or anything anyone would like to throw in there, like to add? Any other vocabulary words you've encountered that are, are tripping you up or? Okay, all right. Well then I'd like to show you now um, something, a series of images, and I call this an illustrative history of China. And what I'm gonna show you are the maps of the dynasties one at a time. And I'd like you to see if you can note a continuity between the maps of all these dynasties. And um, you go ahead and throw it in the comments if you find it, if you can note the continuity between all these dynasties. So I'm gonna show you one at a time. So this image right here, this is the territory in yellow of uh, the Sui Dynasty uh, during its existence. This is the Sui Dynasty, this part in yellow. And you, some people ask, what's this little part that stretches off right here? Out of curiosity, does anybody know? Because that's a feature you see on the maps of some dynasties. Does anybody know what that little, that little like tail, if you will, kind of stretching off is, is? Does anyone know what that is? That's a very particular the reason they control that territory is a very particular reason. Does anybody know what that is? I'll give you a hint, it's two words, and the first one starts with an S, and the second one starts with an R. Silk Road, it is Silk Road, yes. Silk Road, the Silk Road. This little stretch of territory right here, and you're gonna see this on a lot of the other dynasty maps, this is the kind of the way out of China, if you will. It's a pass between the mountains of Tibet, which are down here, and the steppes of the north, which are up here. Right? It's kind of a narrow stretch by which you can get towards the steppes of Central Asia. Uh, it also goes through the Taklamakan Desert, which is over here. Uh, but you notice this on some Chinese maps that they have this stretch of land, and this is this is their essentially their access to the Silk Road. So this is the Sui Dynasty. This is the Tang Dynasty, and again we see this tail kind of stretching off 
out into um, out into Asia, right? Still avoiding the the mountains of Tibet and the the steppes of the northern steppes, if you will. So that's the Tang Dynasty, noticeably larger than the Sui Dynasty. Now this is the Song Dynasty. Um, but I'd like to make a note of these different colors you see here. These are actually non-Chinese states. So these are states that are nomadic in origin. So they were founded by nomadic groups and they existed on the northern borders uh, of China. Now the Song Dynasty, sometimes called Song Dynasty, always had a problem with these nomads. The Song Dynasty did not have a very strong military and so they were constantly having issues with nomads. And sometimes they even had to pay them tribute to not bother them and not attack them. So eventually uh, these nomads would actually take over Northern China. Uh, they would capture the capital of Kaifeng, which is here, uh, and force the, the Chinese court to move south. And that would be the second half of the Song Dynasty. And last but not least, I shouldn't say last but not least, we have one more. This is the Yuan Dynasty, AKA the Mongol Dynasty. And if you notice, um, if you notice all of the extra territory up here, um, that is territory that was ruled by the Mongols. Um, now, originally the Mongol Empire's capital by King Khan was at Karakoram up here in modern day Mongolia. Um, but when the Yuan Dynasty was officially established by Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, um, he moved the capital down to the city we now know as Beijing, and he set up a capital there. So that's actually the beginning of the, uh, the beginning of Beijing as the capital of China, was during the, the Yuan Dynasty. And last but not least, of course, uh, we do have the Ming Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty. And of course, again, we see that stretching kind of, you know, that stretch out into Central Asia. Whoops, no, sorry, I didn't want to do that. Um, that stretch out into Central Asia, as well as a little bit of stretching up into the north, into the steppes. Um, are there any any questions? Did anybody notice a continuity among all of those images, something they all shared in common? Or some territorial continuity, perhaps? Oh, 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 that's immense. Okay, so they all shared the central area near the ocean. So I think you're referring to, and then most empires are concentrated on the East Coast. Yeah. So, yeah, if you've noticed through through these images, um, it does seem like they're all, they have this, they have this center right here. It is on the coast, um, and it's sort of south of the Great Steppes of, of Northern Asia, and it's east of the uh, mountains plateau of Tibet and north of the jungles of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and yeah, every, every dynasty has been based here, at least, um, at least at some point, right? But someone, is, someone else in the chat pointed out, um, uh, Korea and, um, and Elise, Elise, I hope I'm saying that right, sorry, um, is they did all try to some extent to maintain that connection on the Silk Road, that little, that little stretch of, uh, little stretch of land right there. And that was very important to them, right? And then we talk about why China's uh, historically been a great trading state is in part, they've always had access to the Silk Road in a way that was, um, for example, more difficult for Europeans who didn't have a direct route. So, and later on, as, as when you guys talk about the Mongols, you'll see they really had a connection um, to the rest of Eurasia. So, uh, But if you want to talk about continuities, that's a great example of a continuity, right? Almost all the dynasties, no matter who they were founded by uh, or what they were known for, they all occupied that central heartland, um, starting in the north at the North China Plain and then in encompassing the two great rivers of China, uh, the, uh, the Yalu and the Yangtze River. So. That's awesome. Thanks so much for participating, guys. All right. 
Let's talk a little bit about the Grand Canal. This is going to be a quick example of how you can use it, something like the Grand Canal um, for continuity and, uh, continuity and change in an argument. So here's a map of the current Grand Canal, the purple and the green and, and some of the blue. Now, again, it's not one single canal. It's actually a bunch of canals put together. And it's, I might also add, it's still in use to this day. You can go to China and you can take a boat. They even offer tours on the Grand Canal. Um, it's, it's still in use, mostly hauling, you know, manufactured goods, but you can still go see it. It's not, uh, it's not, um, it's not, a, it's still there. It's not like a historical thing we talk about that doesn't exist anymore. Anywho, um, so let's talk about this. So as I said before, the Grand Canal is a canal built by the Sui Dynasty, links northern and southern China. So that's the, that's the, that's the fact. That's like the, the piece of evidence, if you will, for the argument is the Grand Canal. The continuity, the, the event or development that I'm going to argue as a continuity is the unification of northern and southern China. That's the event or the development. And the Grand Canal is evidence of that continuity. The Grand Canal is evidence of that continuity. Now, what I would also need is I would need evidence that this has been happening for a long time, a certain amount of time. So let's say, hypothetically, I was going to say the Grand Canal is part of the continuity of the unification of northern and southern China uh, between the years, say, uh, 200 and uh, 1000. Let's just pick these years, 200 and 1000. So what other evidence would I need to show that there had been continuity? Well, I would need some events um, from between 200 and 1000. And so, for example, I could pick the fact that the Han Dynasty conquered, militarily, politically conquered southern China, even tried to invade Vietnam. What was then Vietnam didn't have a lot of success there. Um, I could point out that after the fall of the Han Dynasty, many Chinese elites and families fled from northern China to southern China to escape uh, the chaos uh, that was happening up there following the fall of the Han Dynasty. And I could point out the Grand Canal. And what these three things are is they are evidence of a continuity. They are evidence that the unification of northern and southern China is a continuity in Chinese history. And so I would make this argument that um, this is a piece of evidence. The Grand Canal is a piece of evidence of continuity in Chinese history. What continuity? The unification of northern and southern China. So you see, when we talk about facts or, or individual people or individual events, um, they, are, they should be viewed, you should think of them as evidence of a larger event, a larger development, something going on over a very long period of time. And so I just want to give you this example of the Grand Canal to work with um, when thinking about change of continuity over time. I might also add, I remember, I, you might have caught it earlier when I said in the north, you have the political heart of China uh, for most of the dynasties. And then in the south, you have the, the agricultural heart of China for most of the dynasties. And that's essentially what the Grand Canal managed to link together, was the extra super productive uh, farmland of the south with the political heart of the north. The great cities of the north, the great capitals like Haifeng and Beijing and Xi'an, would not be able to exist were it not for the Grand Canal uh, bringing food uh, to the north of China. So, something to think about there. All right. Are there any questions before we move on and talk a little bit more about continuity and change? I'm just get a little water, it's hot here. Any questions about China or continuity and change, anything like that, anything at all. What do you think the main use for the Grand Canal is currently? That is a good question. You know, I don't honestly know. I, I would assume I'm going to have to assume it actually is probably still its original purpose. It probably brings a lot of food um, from southern China up to northern China. 
That is an assumption, of course, I can't be 100% sure, but that's probably what they do. Knowing China's large manufacturing base, it, it actually is, it also probably moves some manufactured goods, from maybe from the south to the north, for people to buy them up there. It's a good question, though. We should, we should look that up. I'm sure we could find out. We could find out that answer. That's a great question. And it's just a reminder that again, not everything you study in, in history class is dead or gone. But some of these things are still around. Okay. So real quick, before we talk a little bit more about. Um, CCOT, I want to quick give you guys something I call the value scale. And I'm just using this for this live stream uh, to help you understand quickly um, the, the topics I'm going to give you uh, and how they might have changed or stayed the same over time. And so the value scale is just a quick way to understand that. And so I'm going to use three words with the value scale, which is awesome, okay, or lame. And so when we talk about something that's and that it's in a dynasty, it's referred to as awesome. That means it's something that the politicians love, that the people love, that everybody loves, and it's actively supported and endorsed and, and loved. If something's okay, it means maybe like the politicians don't like it, but the people do, or the people don't like it, but the politicians do, the leaders do. Um, so it's like sort of okay, it's sort of suppressed, uh, but not really. And then lame would be something that's actively resisted or oppressed by either the people or the leaders of that dynasty or that society. And so just real quick, because I'm going to use these to quickly get ideas across. So just that's what I mean by awesome, okay, or lame. All right, so let's, whoops. So just we'll keep that in mind. So here's an example of that at work. So here you have all the dynasties, Sui Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, Ming Dynasty. Um, and how did they look at Confucian values and or Neo-Confucian values after the Song Dynasty? And so from the Sui Dynasty through the Tang Dynasty, you know, Confucian values are okay. The rulers like it and they'll, they'll patronize it and they'll perform Confucian rituals. Um, but they're not, you know, super strong. They're not super hyped on Confucianism. The Tang Dynasty in particular was very, it was a very Buddhist dynasty for the first part of its existence. Um, but the Song Dynasty was really big on Confucian values, so much that like this is the time when the Neo-Confucian ideology was was fully put into practice and uh, cod codified, canonized. But then you have this really big change because in the Yuan Dynasty, Confucian values were actually sort of shunned at first, and eventually they were kind of the door was kind of opened for them. But the Yuan Dynasty was officially not. A Confucian dynasty it was officially a Buddhist dynasty. The state religion was a version of Buddhism. So, uh, but then we go back to the Ming dynasty, which you know, trying to be all things Chinese, they readily embraced Confucian values and, and promoted it greatly uh, during their empire. And so, you know, what could you say about Confucian values over time? What could you say? Well, what could you say if you had to give a description? What could you say about Confucian values over this span of time that I've kind of given you this example of right here? What could you say? Throw it in the someone you know, throw it in the chat for us really quick. What would you say? Just kind of looking at that timeline, what might you say about Confucian values across the dynasties? Alexander says they fluctuated often and were very and were and sorry and very diversely viewed. Well, that's true. It did. It did fluctuate often. Um, but what would you say if you um, if you had to just kind of say one way or the other? Like, did they change or did the did, when you look at this? Let me rephrase this question. When you look at this, do you see more things staying the same or do you see more things changing? That's kind of a, let me, I'll rephrase the question that way. Uh, at least as they start off being averagely accepted uh, by the majority of communities and ultimately became accepted, although some oppose them. So it sounds like, um, uh, at least, and again, again, I'm hoping, I'm sorry, I'm saying that right. Um, so you're saying that in general, it seems like what you're saying is that there was a continuity over time. I hope I have that right. Um, 
a continuity over time. And I think you could make that case because, again, um, you know, they start off as kind of not actively opposed, but accepted, to being super accepted and loved, to being hated, no, I should say hated is a strong word, but not as loved, back to being super loved. So from the beginning to the end, it was mostly love. You could make the case um, that it was mostly love and Confucian values were continually respected over time. That's awesome. Now we're gonna come back to this in just one second, but I wanna talk about something else as it applies to continuity and change. And this is something to really pay, I hope we can all pay attention to just because it's really important. Um, so when you get a continuity and change question, you'll usually get uh, a time frame to work with. So in unit one, it would be 1200 to 1450. Um, but you don't necessarily have to use that entire time. You do not have to argue the entire time. Nowhere in a nowhere in the College Board, you know, course description or guidebook does it say you must use the entire time frame. It only says between X and A and B, but it doesn't say you have to use every single thing between A and B. And so this is what I want to talk about, something called zooming in, zooming out. This is a good way to think historically. So if you zoom in and zoom out, this means that you are looking at the timeline either with an expanded chronological frame or a slightly narrowed chronological frame. So that's for zooming in and then that's for zooming out, expanding your focus. And so let me give you a quick example of what I mean by this. So let's zoom out. Let's use the entire chronological frame. Let's say it's 1200, it's 1450. We'll get every dynasty on there. Um, would our previous assessment of Confucian values not changing over time still hold up if you're only looking at these 250 years? We said there was a continuity last time. Would there still be a continuity? I think you could argue that there would be. Right, because at the beginning it's awesome and by the end it's still awesome. A little interlude, okay, fine. But for the most part, you know, 250 years and only for like 80 or 90 so years this was disliked. So for the most part, you could argue there was a continuity. You could make a strong argument for that. But what if you zoomed in? And what if you narrowed your focus to only these two dynasties? What would you say then? If you only were working with these two dynasties, the Yuan dynasty and the Ming dynasty, would it still be a continuity over time? Would you still be able to argue that there was no change in the perception of uh, Confucian values? By narrowing it down like that, it wouldn't seem like a continuity, or in this case, there is change in that continuity exactly. And so, Again, this is what I call zooming in, right? And by zooming in and narrowing your frame a little bit, you can actually argue instead for a change, right? And so when you're faced with a question like this, it doesn't hurt to occasionally you know, like think about zoom in, zoom out. Maybe do a little brainstorming um, because maybe it might help you understand the question better uh, or allow you to write a stronger answer if you zoom in or zoom out a little bit. And I'll give you kind of a really broad example. If this, if this unit extended, so this unit 1450 cuts the Ming Dynasty almost in half, not quite in half, but it, it chops off the second half of the Ming Dynasty. Um, the Ming Dynasty's policies on foreign trade changed a lot right after um, this unit ended. And so, during this unit, you could say for up to 1450, the Ming Dynasty liked foreign trade, and that afterwards, it didn't like foreign trade. But if you had the entire Ming Dynasty in this time period, uh, it would be harder to make that statement. So it's always good to think, zoom in, zoom out a little bit. Okay. Any questions? I, and we're running against the clock, and I want to make sure we can get to some, some good stuff. So I don't want to take too much time. But are there any questions? And just keep in mind, um, again, nowhere does it say you have to use the entire time frame. although don't narrow it down to like, if you get a time frame of like 800 years, don't narrow it down to like 100 years. Then, we, then you would have a problem 
because then you really wouldn't be able to argue anything if the time frame is that narrow. But let's say you have 800 years, maybe you just narrow it down by like 100 years on each side. Uh, you could totally do that. Unless, of course, you'd be cutting off some pivotal event at the beginning of those years. So just keep that in mind. All right, so that's really quick. And if, again, if you have some pencil and paper, this would be a great time to, to have that out. So here is just kind of a big chart. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but in this first column, in this first column about um, patriarchy, which is the, the system by which um, male figures dominate politics, culture, and, and economic systems. Um, if you were to look at this first column right here, across the, these four dynasties, what could you say about patriarchy? If you just had to kind of look across this four, these four dynasties. And I've included some, some evidence uh, if it would help you make your decision. It was common in all four dynasties and seemed to be mostly accepted. Yeah, no, pretty much. Um, the thing about patriarchy, this is kind of an AP world, just kind of general truth, is that it pretty much exists in most societies with some notable exceptions of some societies um, and only had a few, like, and I'm speaking super broadly here, but it's something you'll notice if you, as you go from society to society to society. There generally is... They're generally male-dominated societies, with some notable exceptions, and we'll get in, you know, there will be streams for those when the time comes. But in general, that's usually continuity is some sort of patriarchy. Now, it is noticeable that Empress Wu, the only female ruler in Chinese history who ruled on her own accord, is in the Tang Dynasty, and the Mongols, in fact, among their own women, uh, practiced sort of a, a good deal of equality among their own women. However, when they were ruling China. They didn't extend a lot of those same laws to the Chinese people they were ruling over. And so, yeah. Same thing with Buddhism here. Pretty much always accepted, if not loved. So the Ming emperors may not have loved Buddhism, but they rebuilt a lot of Buddhist temples that had fallen into disrepair. Um, the Tang Dynasty was a, was a Buddhist powerhouse with this weird exception, I shouldn't say weird, but with the exception of the great anti-Buddhist persecution in the 800s, which is one of the only times in Chinese history where Buddhism is like so thoroughly cracked down, monasteries closed, monks forced to go home. Uh, it was a very, and, and there's a lot of reasons why it happened, but it's a kind of a, it's a unique episode in the history of Buddhism in China to be so thoroughly uh, attacked and thoroughly persecuted. Okay, here is another kind of element chart. And what I'd really like to draw your attention to is this mandate of heaven. And the fact is pretty much every dynasty ever has utilized the mandate of heaven. And they've never questioned this. There's never been, an, an emperor has never come along and said, heaven didn't appoint me. I'm just ruling off my own accord. Right? I'm ruling by the might of my own skill and prowess. No, it's, it's pretty much always been, heaven has deemed me righteous. Heaven has deemed me worthy. Uh, my predecessor was unworthy. Um, that previous dynasty was corrupt and old and falling apart. Um, therefore, I am uh, I am the, the rightful ruler, and heaven says so. It's pretty much continuity across Chinese history. And I think you could make the case that it's the same thing with the nomads. Uh, the one exception of, of nomad rule during this time is that during the Yuan dynasty, the nomads actually were running the show. So for most of Chinese history, they're battling nomads, um, but with a small exception of the nomads get to run the show for a little while during this time. And they will later on too, uh, but we'll talk about the Qing dynasty when we get there. Um, foreign trade, also pretty much always done with a few exceptions. Um, near the end of the Ming dynasty, they start to officially sort of, they, they make an effort to ban and suppress trade. 
but that's in the next unit. So we'll, you know, there's a stream for that. Don't worry. All right. I want to quick give you an example. Since we're running on low on time here, but I want to get a few good examples. So these two images represent a continuity. And so this image on the left, this is a mural from ancient Rome, and it depicts a woman wearing Chinese silks around 200 CE. This is a wall tile. If you've ever seen a tiled wall, um, this is a wall tile, and it has the Chinese dragon, also sometimes referred to as the Azure dragon. And this is actually from, from Persia. Uh, and this is, you can go see this in the Victoria and Albert Museum in Great Britain. So these two images describe a continuity. And I'd like you to go ahead, if someone in comments would like to go ahead and uh, describe what continuity is represented by these two images. This lovely mural uh, and this really awesome uh, wall tile. In fact, I'd love to have a wall just with, with all these dragons on it. That would be just kick butt, I think. Really cool dragon. Beautiful azure, a nice beige to contrast it, just awesome. I wonder if you could get that on Etsy. You could probably find a wall tile like that somewhere. It'd be awesome. So let's see, Lee says, Lee's, again, I'm going to sincerely hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, so the continuity is the adaption of Chinese traditional art forms into their own culture. Well, that's, I think that's definitely true of the wall tile, since the wall tile was made in, uh, was made in Persia, it's not from China. Um, and the mural, well, the mural is made in Rome, it does include a Chinese element in the form of silk. So I think you could make the case that Chinese influence other art cultures. I think that's a fair statement to make, right? As far back as the Romans and as late as Mongol rule over Persia, strong Chinese influence in art. I think that's a fair statement to make, as well as making its way into art of these regions. And I think that's a, a fair point to make. You could also point out trade. Um, the silk, silk is not indigenous to, to, to like the Eastern Roman Empire until the 600s, so it would have to come from China. Um, this azure dragon is during the time when the Mongols ruled Iran, um, Iran or Persia uh, and had a lot of more direct connections with the Mongols ruling China uh, than they would have previously had. So uh, you could also say trade as well as, as influence. I think it would be a fair statement. And influence, of course, can be exemplified through art. So I want to give you, we'll do one sort of short answer question practice. Uh, we're running out of time here, but I want to get one uh, good practice question. So here's an image. Here's another image. Um, and the title is Tradesmen and Nomads. That's what the archaeologist who gave it discovered, uh, discovered gave it. Uh, it doesn't have an official name, but it's from a series of caves in China during the late Tang Dynasty. And so if looking at an image like this, uh, I would definitely pay attention to the wording of the question, interaction, continuity. Interaction means two people working together, tradesmen and nomads, tradesmen and nomads. Okay, continuity. Tradesmen and nomads, Chinese imperial history. Okay, what do I know? Well, I know that the Chinese oftentimes were clashing with the nomads, sometimes trading with them. Uh, but usually clashing with them um, in a not so peaceful form. So I'm going to take a look at this image. I see some writing in Chinese, but I don't, I, I can't read Chinese, unfortunately, except for a few words. And so this isn't going to be much help to me. Um, but I see some people, I see some animals. I see a man here with a sword. Let's see. So these are probably the merchants because they have a, a trade animal with them right here. And if these are the tradesmen, then maybe this is the nomad. Um, I'm looking at their faces. I can't really get a good vibe off of what they might be feeling. 
Uh, but it doesn't necessarily look very calm. It looks like they might be afraid. This guy kind of looks afraid, almost. Uh, can't really tell for sure. Um, but this dude, these are the tradesmen because they're near their goods and their animals. This this dude might be the nomad. Uh, and it looks like he's indicating they should stop and he's got a big weapon with them. Yeah, it's interesting. So how could this depict a continuity in Chinese imperial history? Well, here's one possible answer. The interaction depicted here, nomads troubling Chinese merchants, is a continuity because China has, since the time of the Han, had trouble with nomadic groups like the Huns or the Mongols. This would be a good answer to a question like this. Now, I should note, just for the sake of, of playing devil's advocate, maybe this is the wrong interpretation of this, of this painting. Maybe, in fact, these are nomads offering to protect these merchants. Maybe they're not troubling them at all, which would also not be out of the realm of possibility. Like I said, while the Chinese have battled with nomads, they have also uh, had great trade relations with nomads. Uh, nomads were some of the, the first people to go along the Silk Road and uh, do business along there. So it's possible that maybe this could also be an example of Chinese doing business uh, with nomads across Eurasia. Anywho, um, we're out of time, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to, I apologize, I'm going to have to skip this one, but I'll leave it up for a second if you want to, if you want to try it yourself, uh, maybe watching the replay. Um, this is a multiple choice question that has to do with the civil service exam, uh, and it's asking about which of these uh, it is continuity of, and the civil service exam, as you, as you, as you may know, is uh, something that came about uh, during the Han Dynasty, uh, specifically to promote good bureaucrats. Uh, but the civil service exam, well, that, well, you might think that's legalism because legalism promoted a strong government. It's actually Confucianism because the civil service exam was uh, studying the teachings of Confucius himself. You basically had the civil service exam was interpreting and explaining the works of Confucius. So we're gonna quick uh, skip past this because I have just a few reminders I want to give you guys before we wrap this on up. So real quick, if there are any teachers watching, here are some ways uh, you can introduce continuity and change in your class. Um, things I've done with my students that have been very effective. One is visual timelines, as I said before. I have students draw out a timeline and, you know, mark events and ask about continuity and change, maybe from a chapter in a textbook or a document. Um, so that's one way to kind of get it going. Or if you want to do a little more you know, fun or maybe less academic, ask kids about their transition from middle to high school and ask them how things changed from middle to high school. Because there's usually um, many things when I ask my students this, you know, how did things change going from middle to high school? There are lots of, oh, you know, I lost this friend or, you know, I stopped playing this instrument or started playing this instrument. So there's always lots of things to talk about. And you can use this as a window to kind of getting people to think about continuity and change as comparison over time versus over space. Um, lastly, if you got a class that loves superheroes, uh, I recommend using the Marvel superhero technique where you take Marvel superheroes from the cinematic universe, the movies, and you compare them from their first appearance. Uh, for example, Captain America in the Avengers or Captain America in his movie, the first Avengers, to Captain America by the time of uh, either maybe Civil War or Infinity War, and to ask students how Captain America changed, and not even like storyline, just show them two pictures and ask them to point out the changes and maybe some of the continuities. Right? That's a great way to kind of get kids thinking about change and continuity. So if there are any teachers out there, uh, these are some wonderful ways I've done change and continuity in my class, kind of getting kids on board. Um, so remember, when thinking about CCOT over time, uh, CCOT, and the continuity over time. Remember that it's a comparison, but it's time, not space, right? We're comparing across time, the same place, across time, not space. Remember, you do have the option to zoom in and zoom out, although don't zoom in too far. Remember not to zoom in too far. Um, and also don't forget that while you do describe the continuity and the change over time, um, that you're also asking why, you know, why did this change over time? Uh, not just what changed, but also why it changed over time. Anyhow, um, 
If there are any questions, I'll stick around for, for about a minute uh, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. But as always, you know, think fiveable and, you know, catch some of our upcoming streams. As I said at the outset, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, I'm going to try to catch some of it myself. Um, but, yeah, think fiveable. You are five able. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, you know, reach out to any member of the fiveable team at any time. We're always here. Uh, but if there are no immediate questions, feel free to go ahead and log off. And thank you for coming. I appreciate you spending this time with me this evening. And I hope to see you at a future future stream. And bring your questions, bring your curiosity. I really love your participation uh, in the stream. Thank you so much uh, to everybody who participated in the stream. Um, Lee, again, Elise, I'm sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. Uh, Alexandra, John, um, Karina. Or Kiara, sorry. Uh, who else? Shreya. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for participating, and I hope you uh, hope you have a good evening. Well, like I said, I'll stick around for another. I'll stick around for another minute or so. If anyone has any questions, I can answer. All right. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much for coming.